uh, it's a project I'm working on by myself. Um, so all of the art, code, animation, music, sound, it's all me. So if you really like something, uh, great. If you don't like something, well, I did that too. So um, it's a, a virtual shooter, um, very inspired by like build era games like Super 3D and Flood and Shadow Warrior. Um, but the gameplay is kind of along the lines of uh, kind of like Dark Forces or Resident Evil 4, a little more slower paced than kind of all of the other games in the booter shooter revival. Um, focuses a lot on like using your environments and uh, kind of fighting your way. So like if you want to stick cover and use traps and try to outsmart the enemies, then you can do that. If you want to sprint around like a madman and just shoot the sub machine gun everywhere, you can do that too. Um, so if you guys haven't seen the game before, we'll start with the grave. Uh, and I'll just go ahead and click here. If you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me and uh, I can pause the game at any time. So that follows your character is a uh, detective who is chasing down leads on a string of disappearances that have been happening. Um, grizzly murders, ritual sacrifice, people disappearing. Um, and as he starts to get closer and closer to figuring it out, suddenly the case is entirely shut down and he's ejected from the force unceremoniously. Uh, but of course, since that stinks to high heavens, he continues the search on his own. Uh, he believes that there's uh, not, just not a single killer, but a group operating out of an old abandoned asylum. Uh, so he takes takes on his own and drives out there to investigate. And it turns out maybe not so abandoned after all. And uh, the player is killed upon arrival, but then wakes up in a mass grave, unaware of how he's alive. But all he knows is that he was right, and he sets out to stop the cult from what they're doing. And hopefully they find some answers as to why he's back among the living. And that's all the player knows. This is the first map of the game, so anybody playing this on release would be pretty much treated the same thing. Okay, so sorry, this is time. Uh, back in the old days, where you got a magazine or something in the box and you had to read the background story, or is it implemented in the final game? It's a uh, it's a very hands-off storytelling approach, but you do find a lot of like uh, you'll find like text logs and environmental storytelling elements that kind of show like how the cult came in and how they took over and so cutscenes and dialogue, uh, but more so just stuff you discover as you walk through the world. Uh, but the story is told through the gameplay. Somebody switched me to inverted mouse, I'm gonna switch back out of that real quick. That's much better. We're gonna grab this guy from here. The first stuff you start off with. Despite the enemies being 2D in this game, location damage does matter, or specifically headshots matter. And because the environment's interactive, I'm going to take this lantern with me. So the movement can be very slow and methodical. Um, there are also elements of uh, a more advanced movement system, like uh, you've got like, sprinting and dodging, and uh, you can use air kicks to boost yourself around too and chase those together. So you can get moving pretty quick if you want to learn all of the, uh, all of the specifics. Uh, we're gonna go here. We're gonna light this guy on fire. So if you want to save ammo, there's a lot of options for taking enemies out. And you, the, the hatchet is also a very powerful weapon, and uh, it's always an option for dispatching enemies without using ammo. And in true build engine fashion, I'm gonna point this guy's head down well. This is very important. So, there wouldn't be a retro shooter without lots and lots of secrets. So, hopefully, it has its fair share of those sitting around the environment. I'm going to go ahead and grab an early box of dynamite. Most of Pulpix's levels are fairly open ended, not like, not like Crisis Sandbox style, but uh, usually there's going to be more than one route for each area, and each route usually um, has a different strategy. So, like, there might be one route that is going to be mainly oriented towards long range combat and uh, using the lower action rifle. And then there might be another route that gets you up close and personal, and you're going to be using your shotgun more so. You can pick up pistols. You can use that now. Sometimes the secrets are going to involve blowing the environment up. I wanted to see these big cracks in the wall, indicating structural instability. Gonna punish that wall from existing. So 
dynamite differs a bit from how it's implemented in other games. Um, you can light it and throw it like I showed. You can throw it unlit and shoot it to detonate it. There's also a, uh, a tertiary fire, which I'll show in just a minute. Good opportunity to show. So the tertiary fire, uh, you strip the binding off of the TNT and throw it as a bunch of sticks instead of one single button, which is really useful for enemies that are spread out. And also you can see in the bottom right corner you have a, a TNT quick toss, which without equipping the TNT you can toss a lot of water yeah. and detonate it with a gunshot. The TNT has a lot of utility, it's a super useful weapon that you'll use throughout the game. I'm going to sneak in here and grab this kit. So the field kit um, allows you to have a full health that's going to show up. I'm just going to take some damage here. So the field kit's great for refilling your health in a pinch when you need it. And once your health is full, picking up any first aid kits will store them back in the field kit again so you can essentially recharge it. Once you find it the first time, it becomes a permanent part of your inventory. And managing it is super crucial to getting through the game. Well, sometimes uh, you want to manage, like, if you pick up health when your health is full, only half of that health value goes into the field kit. So it's important to manage, like, maybe you don't want to heal yourself up all the way because you want to maximize the pickups on the ground instead of losing half their value by storing them in the kit. So sometimes you might choose to, sort, to restore your health only to 80 and then just hope you find another health pickup. So it's kind of a healthy economy that you can manage. Yeah. You can stop at any point. So you can get yourself, um, like if you have low health, I'll try to keep myself at like 50 HP, which is enough to survive a shotgun blast. Um, but then if enemies start dropping health more, which enemies will drop health more often if you're almost dead. Uh, so if you can kind of choose the system that way, you can choose. Let me get another cluster bomb on this crowd here. So you got one stick on these guys. So I blew that lantern up, so that guy was fire. My favorite weapon in the game, the Lover Action Rifle. It's a sawed off uh, Merit Select Chamber 24, and it is devastatingly accurate in great headshots. It also has an alt fire mode where you can cycle the lever on equipment. It's a little less accurate, but it lets you pop shots off rapidly, which, when you get a slow motion like that, is super good for just lining them up and taking people out. The Lover Action can also penetrate through a single wall. Uh, or a single solid object or a single enemy. So you can stack enemies up, or you can, like, if the enemy has a shield, you can use it to punch through the shield without wasting ammo. I'm going to try to hit this guy up the stairs to see if it works. Got it. So there's a bit of an exploit in the game that I refuse to remove where if you throw an object and then kick it as soon as you throw it, it'll, like, double the velocity on it. And so you can use that to absolutely just launch things across the map. That's right, you can actually, it's the same thing with the kick boost here, it's technically unintended, but people have so much fun in screen running with it, but I'm like, well, like getting the rhythm down is kind of tough, so it's, you know, it's not something that like every player is just going to do all the time, but once you figure it out, it's like, it's so fun to do. So we call it like kick boosting, or uh, booty hopping. Uh, sort of sent you games, but you also had so many experts, but oh, yeah. well, they kept a lot of them, like money hopping, wasn't yeah, yeah. intended, but right. they kept them until the Swiss go. Like here is an example of uh, this route that I think is kind of a long range route. So if players are trying to experiment with TNT and kind of get the hang of that a little more, they can come this way. But you can also take the road and go up that side path, and that puts you right up close to everybody, and you're having more fun with like the pistol and the axe. Also notable is there's no hit scan in this game from enemies. So as long as you keep on the move, you can kind of understand enemy patterns and keep out of harm's way. Enemy attacks are very consistent, so this guy is always going to have the same amount of time between each attack and the same amount of time between raising his weapon and firing. And those intervals do get shorter if you raise the difficulty, so it's a little more difficult to do this on the higher difficulties. But having enemy attacks be consistent is really key to getting players to experiment, because like I can throw this barrel at this guy, but if every time I step out he's just going to hit scan me, then there's no reason to do it. You can just shoot him. But because you have those options, 
Still a lot of players to experiment a little bit more. Sounds amazing to be running. Yeah. There's so many options to do that's probably the niche speedrun category. Oh, yeah. Yeah, just, uh, just this morning while I was waiting at the Indie booth, I just did a, like a hash it only run for funsies, and uh, it's pretty good times. And once you play on the harder difficulties like Extreme, uh, there's so many more enemies, and ammo gets so much less common that you almost have to really you know, use enemy in fighting, get them to fight each other, throw things at them, maximize the use of lanterns, set TNT traps, all that kinds of stuff is really important for managing your ammo. On normal difficulty, it's not such a big deal. There's a lot of ammo drops, enemies drop it pretty often. Uh, from, from a medicine and perspective, uh, I do require to go on the enemy star. You can set nope. to dodge a lot of them and run through the You can absolutely just strip them up. But the only problem is their pathfinding is pretty decent. So, like, if you just run through the level and stop, eventually they'll probably catch up to you. And so having like, what do we got, 95 enemies on this map? You know, if we were to just run through to this point and then stop here, everybody that we've killed so far would follow us up here. Get the bottom of the bridge. One down back, yeah. Areas like this is where you kind of get a break from them because this is kind of a point of no return. We're going to see sometimes there's a, there's a cultist right ahead there who's standing next to a lantern. And sometimes you really like to take that lantern at me and see if he does it this time. He decided to be nice this time. He decided to go for a swing instead of kicking a barrel at me. But enemies can kick items too. So like if you throw dy if you don't cook dynamite very long, you throw it a cold and speed, he'll probably just kick it back at you. So you sometimes want to give them a little bit more quick time. Since these barrels didn't get destroyed in that fight, I'm gonna go up here and grab this ammo. And also, no continues to this. This won't be in, in the final version of the game. But my favorite, my second favorite weapon is the FP42 Paratrooper correct. It's the only scope weapon in the game. So if you really want to stay far away from enemy, you do have a little bit of ADS capability. But you can also upgrade this weapon to be fully automatic, so you can use it as a battle rifle instead and absolutely just shred through enemies. But the ammo for it is very limited. I'm gonna grab this shotgun now. Look at that. It won't be in this level. Oh, my. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, it's definitely still in the game. You just don't get it this early. So that guy just shotgunned his buddy. And then we deleted him from existence. So this part of the game is uh, it's kind of a combat gauntlet. Most of the maps in Colton have a section where it's more of a longer sustained combat area. And it's kind of a good way for you to test out like everything you've learned in that level and all the weapons that you've gotten. So we're just going to plot through here. Take one shell, like they'll look as bad at the same time. But like once, sorry, go ahead. For, uh, for, for moments like these, is, is there going to be a self kill option or something like that? Like maybe them from behind? So if you, any, any attack on an enemy when they don't know you're there, it deals double damage. So there's not like a, no like stealth kills as in like a scripted thing. Yeah. Uh, but like if you run up from behind and hit them with a hatchet, um, the hatchet does four times headshot damage on heads on soft targets, and then if it's a sneak attack, it's double that, so it's eight times damage, so it'll almost always like splatter them entirely. Perfect. And most of the encounters are designed so that the player is able to approach, um, and as long as he stays out of sight, the enemies won't see you, but as soon as you start shooting, it'll set the encounter up, so you kind of get a chance to, like, down here, these guys should be able to see me, like, realistically, but it gives me the opportunity to kind of figure out how I'm going to start this fight. And that gives the player a lot more opportunities to experiment. So in this case, I'm probably going to cluster down these guys. Launch the chip up here. Loud in here because it's my favorite track in the game. We just conceded the same I wrote them, so they should all be my favorite track. Alright, so there's this little road barricade down here that if I try to throw a barrel down there, that will stop it. I'm gonna break it, then I'm gonna throw a barrel down there. I don't think that's gonna go. That's pretty good. Didn't get all of them, but that's close enough. Uh, 
there and wait for it. It is um, it's somewhat random, but yeah, anytime you anytime you get a critical kill on somebody, so a headshot kill or an explosive kill, it has a chance to trigger. Uh, and it's mostly stylistic. Um, it doesn't give you a ton of advantage in game unless you're doing like like you're unloading on somebody with a machine gun, and then you kind of get that slow motion to focus on all of the heads. are semi-randomized, like enemy drops are randomized. Um, they're slightly weighted based on your inventory, so like if you're low on health, you'll drop health more often. Uh, but uh, yeah, secrets and kills are both tracked. So that player's going to 100% lose. Okay. Uh, you can also duct tape the wall club and a TNT bundle together. And just absolutely destroy people. Those come in handy later in the game. You have enemies that are much spongier against bullets, but they're very weak against fire. And so, um, an enemy catching on fire um, involves getting their burn threshold up to their current health value. So if you shoot them a bit to lower their health, it takes less burn damage to light them on fire. So that uh, TNT bullet top combo is great because it drags their health way down and then applies a ton of burn damage. And so it's a good way to light really had the enemies on fire almost immediately without having to like kite them through flame or use a second multi. It is a it is a fun combo. I'm gonna put a slice from the other chair again. Oh uh, yeah, okay. two for two, that's not bad. I think I missed somebody because the music stops once everybody's dead. I don't know why I missed. Maybe it's axe bad enough. I don't know who I missed. Oh wait, there he is. All right, now. So there are well, Cultic isn't like a straight up horror game. It is obviously a horror theme, and there are parts of the game that are a little more horror than others. Every now and again in the level, I've got a segment that kind of slows things down a little bit and focuses on atmosphere. Unfortunately, you won't get to hear much of the atmosphere right now because of the. Uh, the acoustics, but uh, there's no jump scares or anything like that. Uh, but there are some areas that are a little more, a little spookier and designed a little bit differently from the, uh, the more fast-paced action of all the cultists. Yeah. So when you get into dark areas like this, the player has the option of using their lighter to see better. But if you have the lighter out, you can't use your two-handed weapons. But the lever actually gets a sick Terminator reload if you're one-handing it. So it's not all bad. You get stuck until you damage it. Oh. I choose to disarm all of them because it makes this next segment a little bit easier. Yeah, so there's another document. So these are the text notes. There's uh, there were a few of them earlier in the game that I didn't that I didn't stop and grab, but sorry, my throat's uh, starting to feel me a little bit. Alright, I'm gonna grab this key and get started. We're just gonna avoid these guys. So you can see the way that we came in is now blocked up. Yeah, we're a little bit stuck in here. The mold house, you know those guys house too? Or They are uh, from a lore standpoint. Uh, they are people that have been abducted that are waiting to be butchered for meat by this guy with the chainsaw. They are they're what makes this part kind of fun is that those, uh, those guys from the ceiling are mostly harmless. 
But because of how tense this part is, everyone gets like really freaked out when they drop down. And then they kind of ignore this guy who's the actual threat. Okay, yeah, that's the other thing is if they if they put their lighter away to get the shotgun out, then they're having to operate off of the candle light in this room. Excuse me. They're almost harmless. They don't, they can't see the player. Um, if you get close enough to them, they'll kind of like flail at you just because they're they're terrified. But uh, they are themselves not really much of a threat. They only take a couple of shots to kill you. And then with that, you're kind of back into the uh, back into the thing of things. Got so much dynamite. Here, so. We'll go ahead and catch up with some first aid. So they can took a bit of damage from the chainsaw guy. Any of that key that I grabbed on the mattress. Now we're back here. I didn't use the sniper rifle like at all. But yeah, and with that key, that is the end of the first map. I definitely didn't grab all the secrets. There's 11 of them in the first map. Yeah, I took I took pity on a few of the, the hanging corpses. They didn't do anything wrong. So, if either you guys want to give it a shot, that's what you're open to. Or if you just have questions, or there's a second map I can show you, or.